Hi, my name is Brandon. Welcome to our Gender Equity Forum. Now we're going to have a conversation with four special guests. Today we are privileged to welcome Jackson Katz. He is an educator, author, filmmaker, and world-renowned pioneer in gender violence prevention education. In 1993, he co-founded Mentors in Violence Prevention, one of the most widely implemented and influential sexual and relationship abuse prevention programs in schools, colleges, sports culture, and the military in North America and beyond. Jake Ford, who most of you know as Coach Ford, will also be joining us today. After graduating from UCLA, he went to grad school to study clinical psychology at Pepperdine. Afterwards, he worked at the LA County Child Protective Services for 15 years before he joined the Brentwood community. He began coaching in the middle school, where he now teaches human development and has been the head varsity football coach for the past two years. He has coached and taught a number of our students here today and has had a lasting impact on our community on and off the field. We are glad to welcome Teresa Rogers. Despite being a licensed nurse and having a law degree from Loyola, she considers her greatest accomplishment her five incredible children. She is mother of Robbie Rogers, a star player for the Los Angeles Galaxy. In 2013, he became the first openly gay man to compete in any American professional sports league. Ms. Rogers has joined us here today to give us a mother's perspective during the dialogue. We are also honored to welcome Jerry Teo. Mr. Teo is an expert in family strengthening, community mobilization, and culturally based violence prevention and intervention issues. In short, Mr. Teo understands communities and the relationships that hold them together. Some of us have heard him speak at an earlier conference, and I am very excited that Mr. Teo is here as he has deep insights into how young men think and how to develop them into positive role models. Moderating, this, moderating the conversation are seniors Christopher and Cheyenne. Please welcome them to the stage. Hi everyone, and I hope you enjoy the movie. And now we're gonna start by asking one specific question to each of the panelists. Then we're gonna move forward in asking general questions to all of them. And eventually we're gonna open it up to everyone in the crowd to ask any question you want. So our first question is for Mr. Katz. And you've mentioned that domestic violence and sexual abuse are often called women's issues, but you believe that they're actually men's issues and in some ways tied to the definitions of manhood. What do you mean by that, and in what ways is the film relevant to everybody here? Thanks, Shan. Um, before I answer that question, let me just say I think this is a great event. I applaud you all, Christopher and Cheyenne, Brandon, and all the young women and men who made this possible, as well as your, you know, the, the faculty, the faculty and staff and administration at the Brentwood School. So yeah, everybody deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Because honestly, one of the things that needs to happen is we need to have honest, open dialogues about these kind of things. And Jennifer Siebel Newsom's, Newsom's films are a great vehicle for catalyzing the kind of conversation that we need to be having. So I'm glad you all saw the film, and I'm glad we're all here with this opportunity with these great panelists, and so thanks. So basically, my answer to your question is, um, historically, most people have understood domestic violence and sexual assault and sexual abuse and sexual harassment as women's issues that some good men help out with. But a big part of my work for a number of years, both scholarly and activist, has been to reframe these issues because I don't see them in this way. I don't see them as women's issues, yes, and then there are good guys who help the women out. In fact, a big part of my work is trying to reframe it and say these are men's issues. Men have to engage. Men have to be taking responsibility, both because the majority of the abuse is perpetrated by men, and that's a fact. Men, you know, most men are not violent, but most violence is done by men. Whether the victims are women or men or children, men are the primary perpetrators, and that's not an anti-male statement. It's a statement of fact, and the question is what do we do about it? 
And a lot of men, when they hear the term women's issues, they think, you know, well, okay, that's a women's concern. I'm a guy and it's not for me. And I think that's a problem. And we need more men having that conversation. Um, and men are also the victims of violence, both at the hands of other men and sometimes at the hands of women. And, and so we have to talk about men as victims as well, both physically, emotionally, sexually, and attend to the needs of men who are themselves the targets of harassment, abuse, and violence. Um, let me just, one last thing, I'll just say, Women have clearly been at the forefront of addressing these issues in the culture. W women's leadership, in other words, in the domestic violence area, in the sexual assault, sexual harassment area, the sexual abuse of children area. Women's leadership in a multicultural, multi-ethnic sense has been utterly transformative on a local, national, and global level. It's an ongoing process, but women's leadership has been incredible, and women have been able to do so much. But there hasn't really been enough leadership on the part of men, and uh, I think we have, you have, your generation has a, a challenge in front of you. The 21st century, one of the great global challenges is gender equality and reducing gender violence. And women and men need to work together to achieve this. Um, and I, I think, uh, hopefully, that's one of, the, uh, one of the things we're here doing today is talking about how men can be, talking about men and talking about men's issues, if you will, and how they intersect with women's lives and men's lives are part of that um, big long-term change that has to happen. So there, there, there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Coach Ford. So football is often seen as a sport dominated by hypermasculinity. And uh, we want to, how do you deliver an alternative message to your team? And in what ways is your counseling background connected to your coaching philosophy? I think that the goal of a coach uh, and a team is remains the same over time. I mean, I think you're, as a coach, I'm trying to develop s mentally strong, physically strong, teamwork-minded young athletes. I think that the way that the message is delivered is what needs to change. I think that, um, you know, using demeaning terms, calling a, a player a sissy, or saying that they throw like a girl is not a way to motivate in this day and age, for sure. Uh, I think it's important to, you know, be mindful that we are giving the kids a message that, you know, I want, I want to give my football team a message that I could cut and paste and give to the girls' soccer team and get the same result. Uh, so the message needs to not be gender-based, more so just kind of talking about their skills and their, their ability level and their, and their effort. And as it relates to my counseling background, you know, I think it's, you get a lot more out of students and out of young men when you are encouraging to them. And I think that they, they feel a lot more empowered when they, when they see that their coach recognizes their, their good actions or their efforts. And so <clears throat> I've, I'm not one to curse at my players, to yell at them. I'm super encouraging. And I think that that has paid off. And I think that, that they appreciate that. They appreciate somebody in their life that's really looking at, at the good things that they do. Thank you, Mr. Cutchford. <laughs> Mrs. Rogers, your son courageously became the first openly gay US male professional athlete. Looking back, is there anything that you did that helped him feel comfortable being himself, or is there anything you wish you had done differently? Well, I'm so glad to be here as a mother. Uh, uh, it's a coaching job, uh, most assuredly, just as some of you gentlemen, because you have to bring out the best in all of your team and all of your children. And so I, I would say uh, the one thing that as a mother with Robbie, that I tried to instill in him, as with all of my children, is that you are unique and that you were created for a divine purpose that only you can fulfill. And uh, I, was, I was amazed when Robbie, uh, when we, were, we would chat about where he was, where he came from, and where he is now. And one is his, of his fears that he articulated to me is, you know, you always said I was perfect just the way I was supposed to be. And I thought, 
when you found out I was gay, you wouldn't think I was perfect. Um, I think what I tried to instill in Robbie, and I think what he came to learn was, he was perfect, and he is perfect just the way he is. And through the things that he is, he's fulfilling his purpose. As a great athlete, and as a model to many young people, and to many of us that perhaps had our eyes closed in, uh, in regards to a lot of different issues. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tello, or Teo, uh, as you mentor young men, what do you find that they have most trouble with in developing their identity? Well, let me, let me first uh, just talk about uh, that word identity. And, and you know, identity really is uh, who am I? And you know, when a baby comes in this world, uh, what they're searching for is, is the answer to that. Who am I? Uh, who do I belong to? Who accepts me? Who cares for me? And, and, and how do I fulfill, as you mentioned, your sacred purpose? And, and I know that that, uh, that that comes in a lot of different forms. And if you grow up in a family that, you know, that provides that for you, I know, you know growing up in my own family, uh, living in Compton, I grew up in Compton in a neighborhood that uh, you know, it was, it was very common to hear, you know, drive-by shootings and drug deals and all of that, and my father doing the best he could, but, but my father wasn't around because he was working the whole time, and, and so many of us don't have fathers or not, that are around, and even if they're around, they're not really around. And what I mean by that is they maybe they're physically, but their spirit got, got, got caught up. And, and, and sometimes I work with men that are 45, but they're really five, because they got stuck at five. And, and, and so how do you fulfill your purpose if, if you're physiologically you're 15, 16, 17, 18, but emotionally you're, you're caught up at five? And, and, and then, you know, you, you, you know, so some of you look at your fathers, and we often blame our fathers and, and our grandfathers and all those people who give us these, role, these roles, these, these, these gender-specific ways that, that are maybe are misogynistic or, or very sexist. Um, and, and, you know, and I had to look at my father that way. You know, and, and why did he do this, or why didn't he do this, and why couldn't he tell me he loved me, and why was he so harsh, and why was he so all of this, until I came to the point where I had to realize that my father was a boy at one time, and my father went through the very same things, and my father got stuck. And, and so that identity of how do you form an identity, you know, and, and, and it, so then I become a father, right, and I'm raising a son, and, and trying to not do what my father did, not to trying to be more... Uh, wholesome and inclusive and teach my son that he can cry and that he can express himself and be open to, to whoever he is, right? But he lives in this world. He lives in this world, and my son is now a junior in high school, and he comes home, and he's a real good kid, and, he, and, and he's, you know, real expressive and friends with a lot of people, and he comes home, and he walks in the door, and, and I can tell he's upset. I, you can just tell if you're close to your children. You can tell. You don't have to, you know, do an interview or do an assessment. You can tell, right? Uh, and, and, and so my son comes. I said, Marcos, what's the matter? Nothing, man. I said, no, oh, what's up, man? Oh, it's all right, you know? And we do that a lot. We just kind of, you know... And, and that word, nothing, you know, and you hear it in the little boys. I work with little boys, and what's wrong? Nothing. What's the matter? Nothing. You know, and, and that nothing, what that nothing means, we do it to our parents, too. What's the matter? Nothing. You know, it's, it's cool. I'm okay. I mean, and what nothing means is, you know, I don't know if, if, if I can really share this with you without you going off, without you triggering and, and, and judging me, you know. And so that's what my son was saying to me. And I said, Amico, what's the matter? He says, well, Dad, I don't know, you know. He says, well, I'm doing good in school and everything, and I got a lot of friends. I got a lot of girlfriends and guy friends and stuff, and I'm all these committees and stuff. And, you know, I told you there was a dance Saturday night, right? It was a dance Saturday night, so there's this couple of girls that I've been talking to and kind of real good friends with them, and so I asked one of them to go to the dance. And you know what she told me? She says, no, you're like a brother to me. You know, you're too nice, you know. Uh, 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 you're more like a brother. And he says, why does all the fine girls go to the, go to the guys that treat them bad? And so I, you know, I got, well, it's probably because she grew up in a home that, she says, Dad, don't get psychological. I mean, I need a date Saturday tonight, you know? And, and, and the dilemma of, you know, because that's the reality sometimes is that it's not just a men's issue, it's a women's issue, too, in, in, in that, you know, how do I, you know, hold on to my identity? How do I become what I need to be in this life? But, but you deal with a real deal. 
the real deal of how do you balance this, this, this world out. And so your identity then becomes a, a point of value, right? A point of how do you value other people but still be able to navigate you know, this world in a way where you, you have a purpose but also you can be able to, to, to navigate through life in a good way. You know? and, and so I think that's you know, the, a, a really creating a space for, for men in general, not just young men, you know, but, but for men in general to be able to explore this. How do we explore that? We need a space to explore this where we feel safe, where we can ask those nitty-gritty questions, right? And, and, and then, and there's not sometimes clear-cut answers, but there's a, a what you need is, is somebody to say, well, I don't have the answer, but I'll walk with you. You know, and that's what we need to d develop, that sense of let's walk together that way. Thank you so much. So now we're going to open up the entire panel. So if we're going to ask a question, anyone can answer it. Um, so a lot of students here went to the women's conference, and everyone just saw the mask you live in today. So moving forward, how can we get away from those often narrow definitions of masculinity and femininity? Well, I think uh, when we live by definitions, we're living in a very narrow channel. And what, I've, what I would recommend, and, and I'll use Robbie as an example, Robbie was so afraid that if he didn't represent something that he deemed to be an athlete, he wouldn't have chances in athletics. He wouldn't be invited on the older teams. He wouldn't be invited to the Olympics. He wouldn't make it into the MLS. And it was a tremendous price that he paid personally. He had to keep emotions in his head uh, that really uh, eventually led to physical and, and uh, really detrimental things to him as a person. I think what we have to do is we have to live outside of that head and that box, and we have to address the idea of courage and of truthfulness. So that when we have an issue of what makes me a man or what makes me a woman, that we look at life and we look at others and we look at that in a respectful way. I mean, I think it's important to uh, get our terms clear. I mean, there's the difference between sex and gender is critical here, right? So sex is biological, what you happen to be born with, the secondary sex characteristics you happen to be born with. Most people are born either male or female, but there are people who have, um, are intersex who don't have either male or female. But gender is a, is a category that people with this or that biology are assigned a set of characteristics that, uh, that, that sometimes correspond with those uh, biological characteristics, but there, it varies widely. All, across the world, for example, what is masculine and what is feminine, it varies widely. In the same society, in different subcultural groups, there's different definitions of masculine or feminine. So there's no such thing, really, as a singular idea of masculinity or femininity. It's, it's an ever-changing process, and again, your generation, my generation, our generation, is involved in this incredible transformation that's been happening, propelled by the modern you know, multicultural women's movements over the past several decades, where notions of femininity from the past are, uh, if you contrast the things that women are doing today and some of the expectations some of the young women in this room have for your own lives, if you look at that in historical terms, it's incredibly unprecedented. It's incredible what's been happening globally in terms of women's leadership and women's engaging with issues and professional and, you know, uh, ambitions that historically had been ex women had been excluded from. And that's one example. There's so many things, different pieces to that. But men as well have been changing. And all, this is true always, by the way. The idea that change is somehow uh, just a, a recent development is not, is ahistorical as well. Change is always happening in terms of what it means to be masculine or feminine or man or woman. The question is how are, we going to, how are we going to build healthier definitions that make both women and men and others who are not either women or men, you know, healthier. Um, and, and one of the challenges for us as men, those of us who are men who are doing this work, is to try to think outside of some of the narrow boxes of manhood that we've been um, grown up with. And some of us who either had fathers or didn't have fathers, um, 
some of us are kind of blazing a new trail because, some, you know, I didn't have a father or a stepfather that I could look to as, a, as an exa exemplar or as a model for how to deal with the modern world because my stepfather, who I grew up with, didn't have the skills and he, didn't, he certainly didn't have the skills to teach me. And a lot of men are in that position, trying to figure it out. And a lot of us take some of our cues from women because we, we don't, you know, we see women doing these incredible things and trying to expand the definitions and we learn from women. But one of the great things that you, your generation has, more than I think our generation, is that there is a growing movement of men, both in the United States in a multicultural, multi-ethnic sense, and, uh, and all over the world, a growing movement of men who are finally starting to say, you know what, some of this stuff is messed up. Some of the traditional ways of you know, keeping your feelings in or expressing it only through anger or violence, some of this is really limiting, and, and it's destructive to men as well as to women, and we can do better. And so. We're, we're all part of this growing conversation. How can we do better? Uh, how, can we, how can we be healthy and, and still be strong? That's the last thing I'll say. Strong, some people will say in, incorrectly in critiquing these kind of conversations that we're saying we're, men have to be wimps and we have to be soft. And we, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't buy that at, at all. This is a, it's, it's, we, I want men to be strong. I want myself or my 14-year-old son to be strong. The question is, what does it mean to be strong? And I, I reject the, 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 you know, the very narrow definition of strength that resides in being dominant over another person, imposing your will. That's a measure of strength. Emotional vulnerability is another measure of strength, to be honest with you. A man who can say, I'm, 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 I need help. I, I don't have it all figured out. That takes great strength. And, and the idea that somehow you have to present yourself as, in the traditional way, physically dominant and in control at all times is highly destructive both to other people, including women, but also to men themselves. So, it's, so how can we create definitions of strength for men and young men that is more expansive than the traditional definitions? That's one of the great challenges of our time, I think. Let me just say that, that, um, that when we talk about wholeness, we talk about balance, it's really about connectedness, our ability to connect and relate and honor and respect whoever you're, you're, you're involved with. And, and disconnectedness, when you become disconnected, or you become wounded, you become rigid because fear is at the base. And, and, and so if you have not experienced or don't have um, a life that has blessed you and connected you and, and, and honored you and you don't have places to go when when you feel that disconnectedness, then, then it, it comes in many, many forms. And some of you saw in the film uh, some young guys who were locked up. Their experience in life may be very, very different. And, and, you know, and, and I'll tell you, I'm a very peaceful person, but in certain places where I'm at, in certain neighborhoods that I'm at, you know, I, I gotta front up. I, I gotta act a certain way. I gotta be you know, a certain way you know, in order to, to, to get through. The, 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 the difference is, that I don't get stuck there. And sometimes what happens is you get stuck with that mask, that front, that, that, that walk, you know, um, and, and you can't shift. You, you can't, you know, and, and I know, you know, even growing up as a young man in the neighborhood, you know, I had to front up and I had to act a certain way and we'd be, between my friends, we would play a certain way. But if I got stuck and I walked in and I greeted my mother the same way I greeted my friends, and that was inappropriate. I, you have to know how to shift and how to shift down and how to, uh, to heal down, if you will. And, you know, and, and, and since I have the mic, I, I, want, I want to just, just uh, take this opportunity of, of me as an older man apologizing to the young men in this room. Because you all struggle in your generation with some things because we didn't do our work. Because we got stuck. Because we got stuck and we then filtered to you certain teachings that were false teachings. That we, because of our inability to be vulnerable and, and, and our instead wanting to wear that mask, if we could have just had the ability and had the willingness and had the vulnerability to take off the mask and maybe do some of our own work that we could open up and even say to you, you know, son, I don't know how to do this. And I remember my, my, my boy, when he was 13, we had this big celebration for him. And, uh, and I had a good relationship with my son, but 13, 
you know, we, everybody after the party was over and the food was gone, everybody goes home, right? And they're just uh, us there. And my, I went to my son's room and I said, you know, because he, he, he had to speak that day. He had to talk to people. That's part of the rites of passage. And, and, uh, and I said, I'm proud of you. You did a good job. But something hit me as I was talking to my son. I, I said, son, you know, um, my dad died when I was 13. I don't know what to do after this. And it shocked me and it froze me. And my son put his presence down and turned to me and said, that's okay, Daddy. We'll learn together. And, 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 and I'm saying that to you because it's not like, 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 like we always have to teach you. Inside of you, you know. Inside your spirits as young men in that sacred part of you, you know. You know what is honorable. You know what is sacred. And when you don't know, then it's your responsibility to look for somebody to ask. And so now that I've apologized to you, I'm saying, now I want you to step up. I want you to step forward and take where we've taken you and you move it now. You create a different world. You create different definitions. You create a different relationship amongst all people because that really is what growth and healing and development is. Um, Mr. Katz mentioned how recently women have made great progressions. And while we're still kind of talking about that, that topic, what has caused the term feminism to have negative connotations with some people? <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff, Open question to all you guys. <laughs> Anytime people push forward the democratic project, small d democracy, push forward and break down structures of inequality, there's going to be pushback. And when you have civil rights movement that challenged white power and, and white supremacy, there was pushback. Those people just, you know, I mean, there's, there's in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, as the gay and lesbian movements moved ahead in the last several decades, there was pushback on the part of heterosexual people who were felt threatened by that advancement of democratic values and enlightenment values. Women have been pushing to be treated with full dignity and respect. This is what feminism is about. To me, if, you don't, if you're an American, say, and not everybody's an American, but most people in this room probably, if you're an American and you say you believe in the values of this country, democracy, fairness, freedom, justice, and you're not a feminist, you have to explain to me how you can reconcile saying that you're a proud American who believes in those values and not be a feminist. Because to me, feminism is that basic. Right. It's, it's that basic. But understandably, one of the, one of the, one of the methods of a, of a, in this case, of a dominant culture that is threatened by the changes that are being pushed by people who are identified as feminists, one of the first responses is, is an old one. It's, it's ancient. It's called kill the messenger. Kill the messenger means instead of dealing with what, the, what people are saying and the substance of their arguments, fairness, equality, justice, equal treatment, which is all feminism, you make it so that the individuals who are promoting that point of view are stigmatized in some way. So then you don't have to deal with the arguments because you've now written off the person. She's ugly, she's a man-hater, she's got an agenda, she believes in female superiority. All that kind of, that kind of obvious propaganda, obvious to many of us, is an attempt to keep women from pushing the boundaries that they've been doing. And that, so that, I think that's the reason why a lot of uh, people react negatively to feminism because they're reacting to, this, to the propaganda rather than to the ideas, because it makes them a little bit uncomfortable. And I think, I think that's true for women and for men in different ways. But th th I just want to say, there's a lot of men who are very supportive of feminism, who are not threatened by feminism. As a man, I'm not threatened by feminism. When I, was, when I learned about feminism back in the, when I was in, you know, a college student back in the late, um, I think it was the Mesozoic era. It was like, <laughs> but when I was a young guy, it was I didn't like think, oh my God, these women hate men, or they're they 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 they've got an agenda against men. I was like, that's how. I, if I were a woman, I, feel, I I wish that I would have the guts to stand up for myself and speak out for my own rights and dignity. And I recognize feminists as leaders who are pushing forward the democratic project in the in the world and the Enlightenment ideal. And I respected it. And as a man, I, I, I try to figure out from the beginning, from the time when I was a young guy, 
how can I as a man be supportive of this? And I don't see that as, as, as being like a self-hating man. I think that's another ridiculous idea, that, that men who support feminists are somehow undermining ourselves. I think it's, I don't believe that for a second. I think the question for men is, how can we be supportive of gender equality and fairness and equal treatment and kind of sort of embody a kind of manhood that is accepting of that rather than resistant towards it? And, and I think there's an awful lot of men, including in this room, who are on the side of women's uh, equal treatment and equal justice. And I think more of us need to speak out, especially in the current political climate in the United States when there's a lot of men who have a lot of power and a lot of public platform who don't believe in women's basic rights. And I think, I think those of us who do need to have a, a much stronger and louder voice, especially at this current moment. So we only have time for one more question, but Obviously, you guys are all very passionate about this, and so we just want to know what made you want to participate in this today, and also the ideas of masculinity and femininity. Like, how, what's, what makes that an important issue in your line of work? Well, I wanted to participate because I think that, especially in athletics, there really is this push for or you know, there's a culture of hypermasculinity, and and you know you got to man up, and you got to be be a man and be tough. And uh, I kind of wanted to break down that barrier a little bit, and you know be here to to support and say that you know we support as a as a athletic program, we support as a football team, uh, and we are interested in this and. Uh, I don't want us to fall into or, or be perceived as those are the jock guys and they're they're the you know the chauvinist macho guys and they don't have a brain and they just <laughs> you know I wanted us I wanted you know I wanted to show our support. Um. When I was a kid, uh, you know, grew up in a big family and, and saw a lot of pain. But I saw a lot of pain through the community. And, uh, and in spite of that, I had a mother that would take people in. Uh, I had a grandmother that would feed everybody. And, uh, and my dad would say, instead of complain, do something. So uh, I learned early on that, that uh, our uh, that my, my plight, that my road was, was of service, was that, that um, and that you honor all relationships. And, and that was a, you know, it was, it was an interesting thing, even culturally for me, because I grew up in Compton, I grew up in a black-brown neighborhood, and, and so, you know, uh, as a Mexican family, and, and then living with African-American families is real interesting, but my grandmother didn't see any color and didn't see any different, because when my best friend Tyrone would come over, she would say, pues quien quiere comer, right? And, Tyrone raised his hand like that. I don't know where he learned Spanish from, but he raised his hand like that, right? And, and she said, well, pasale, Miko, and he would come in, and, and she would treat him the same way she would treat me, and, and his grandmother, Miss Mosley, would treat me the same way. And, and, and I learned, you know, that, that the essence of our living is not about how much money we make or how smart we are and all of that, because I think that in traditional indigenous cultures, it's all about relationships. And many, many of the strongest cultures across the world are matrilineal are really guided by women, and, and in those communities, they realize that women carry the spirit and the heart. And, and, and so because of that, you know, even though I thought in my house my dad was the boss and macho and everything, and I'd ask him, can I go out? My, dad's, my mom would say, wait till your dad goes home. And his car would roll up, and, okay, can I ask him now? No, no, let me feed him first. And so then she'd go feed him. I didn't understand she was only feeding him food, she was feeding him information, right? So by the time I got to him, he'd already been fed what she wanted him to tell me, right? And I go to my dad, well, can I go out? What'd your mom say? And and what I realized is that, is that, that my mom, that my dad understood, that, that, that my, my, my mom um, really understood the essence of, of creation, of forgiveness, of interconnection, and of blessing. Because you can have everything in the world, and regardless of the terms of everything, but if you don't know how to be in relationship with people, and you don't know how to forgive, and you don't know how to heal, and you don't know how to grow, but interesting, even though we knew that after a while my mom made all the decisions, really, 
and we'd tease my mom, hey, can I, can I go out? Wait to ask your dad. Mom, are you going to tell him what to do, man? Come, just tell us now so I can start getting ready. And, and, and we'd tease my mom and tease my dad. <laughs> even after my mom knew, and even after we joked about it, my mom still gave my dad his place. And as men, one of our biggest fears is that we'll no longer be valued because of our woundedness. So creating a sense of balance in this, you know, is really, really critical. And this conversation, you know, is, is important, but it's important for this conversation to only be the beginning conversation. And, I, and, and that this conversation, I know you're going to have conversations tomorrow, but these are the conversations you need to have with your friends, with your family, and, and circle up among yourselves and continue this conversation, you know, so that we can really have a world that, that releases definitions and releases borders and barriers, and we see each other as interconnected people. So now we're going to open it up to everybody, and I'll be going out in the crowd, and so will Christopher, and there's a few other people. So does anyone have a first question? Don't be shy. Um, this question is for Mr. Katz specifically. Do you feel like um, some of the more misogynist and homophobic institutions such as athletics or fraternity and sorority life at the college and university levels can be retrofitted um, <laughs> in order to achieve this equity or do you feel like these are things that should be dismantled? Mm. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm a realist. I, I consider my uh, orientation, I, I call myself a pragmatic radical. And I, 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 I feel like, for example, football culture. Football is incredibly influential. This is the Super Bowl weekend. I mean, this is like the national religion, right? It's, it's a secular holiday, you know? It's Super Bowl Sunday. And, you know, I don't think it's realistic to think that we're going to not have football culture, you know, in the next few years or something. I mean, it's part of American culture. It's deeply rooted. It's going to be part of our culture. How do you, how do you take that and how do you, uh, you know, sort of transform it to the extent that you can in ways that are less harmful and, and lift up the things that are more, you know, positive, if you will. Military, the military is a gigantic part of our culture. We have a, we live in a society with a gigantic military budget and a military presence, both locally and globally. I work extensively with military. It's like the military isn't going away. The question is, how do you do, how do you work with it, that institution to make it more responsive to human needs? How do you make it more progressive in terms of the gender politics and the sexual politics? Because it's not going away. I mean, fraternities, and sororities on college campuses are deeply rooted. They are, they, they are in transition. They're, they've been in transition for a number of years. So I'm, I wouldn't call myself an abolitionist. I would, in, this, in that sense, I would call myself a reformer, which is to say fraternities and sororities play a really positive role too. They're not just, it's not just, they're not just bastions of illegitimate power and privilege. They're, there's some emotional needs and relational needs that they're serving that can be better served with a more thoughtful and progressive um, orientation and more accountability for abusive behavior. So I think, I think that's what I would, where I would go with it. I wouldn't just write it all off and say we have to abolish it because I don't think that's realistic and I, and I don't think it's quite fair, but I think we need a lot more accountability. Um, you know what I mean? I think, I, I, I think we, there's, there's power that resides in some of these institutions and some of the power is power that resists change and that resists accountability. And I think that, and again, in a democratic society, we have to figure out how to hold people accountable if they act abusively, both institutionally and individually. And by the way, can I just say, because I want to make sure I say this, even if the, none of the questions directly address it, I think it's really important that white people speak out about racism, especially in the current moment where there's so much ugly racism that has reared its head. It's always been present in American culture, but it's more somehow okay or acceptable to express some of that in the current moment. And just like I'm saying we need men who have the courage and the strength to challenge men's violence and men's abuse and men's sexism, we need more white people who have the courage to challenge other white people's racism and, and anti-immigrant sentiment, just as we need more heterosexual people who have the courage to stand with our you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender uh, friends, allies, and partners 
and challenge and speak out against heterosexism. So in each case, members of the dominant group, members of powerful institutions have a po positive role to play in helping to advance democracy, human rights, and social justice. Um, hi. Okay, so my question, which is kind of a broad one, I guess, is, so you guys, a lot of you have spoken about how we need to look more um, of issues of gender inequality as both women's and men's and people don't fit into the gender binary. As somebody, um, as, so I consider myself like a very outspoken feminist, but I get a lot of pushback in the sense that a lot of people don't want to hear it or that they think it's only a woman's issue. What would you say to those people? What would your, be, or what would your advice be for what I should say to those people? Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. I think that, that uh, for me, uh, developing relationship with people first, meaning you, you, you develop relationship based on, on what you have in common and the connection, because I think when you develop relationship, then you create um, spaces for dialogue and spaces for movement. And, and I think that, that you know, it becomes um, really important to, to find your allies. Because if, if I'm challenging somebody that I don't have a relationship with, it, it, it may become adversarial. But if, if, I, if, if I have a relationship or, or I'm connected to somebody that has a relationship with those people or that, that person, then we can shift the paradigm and shift the narrative. Because it really is about how do we um, move to a different narrative, to a different paradigm, and a different way of, of understanding relationships and understanding our sacredness and understanding you know, the, the misogyny and, and, and the, if you will, the inequity. Um, but I also think it's important um, how you do that. So you can have a message, and if you come full force at somebody, um, and sometimes that won't be received in a good way. I'm not saying that sometimes you don't need to be strong and come up front with messages. But knowing, have a flexibility about how you create, you know, uh, how you share messages and how you, uh, you know, broach situations and, you know, I think will then give you, you know, more success in terms of, because what we want in the end is, is a, 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 a shift, you know, a shift in ideology of how we see each other, a shift in our pedagogy about how we really relate to one another, and then an accountability of how we collectively can move something forward. And I think, you know, I mean, you have an example here, you have a coach here that even though you, we may be in institutions where well, football is very, you know, hyper-masculine, you have one person that chooses to do it different and can influence a whole bunch of people, right? And if we, each of us take responsibility by that with our, our circle of influence of who, who, we're, uh, who we're around, we can begin shifting the norm until the norm becomes larger. It becomes larger in terms of us respect, the whole sense of respect and equity. Hi, so this is just a general question um, for anyone. So what I've noticed is when I've gotten into discussion about people with feminism and gender equity is that one of the most common responses I've gotten from women, men, like friends, family friends is we don't need it. It's not necessary. And kind of like, well, we're fine. Everyone's equal. What's the problem? And so my question is, I guess, why do you think some people kind of have this preconceived notion that we don't need feminism, that we don't need to talk about men or women in this way. And how do we kind of go from that to kind of prove to these people that yes, we do need it, we do need to support both women and men and that it is in fact needed in society? That's a great question. I mean, I think, I think that's why we need more education because the idea that somehow we've already gotten to gender equality and we don't need that is incredibly ignorant. There's, we're not even close to gender equality in the United States or globally. We're not even close. We have generations and generations of work ahead of us before we could even claim to be close to gender equality. It's like saying because we have a black president, we don't have racism. It's like, are we gonna credit that with, as a, an intellectually serious position? It's ridiculous. 
Of course, racism is much deeper than whether we have a black president. So sexism, yes, women have made incredible strides. Women are doing things that are incredible. But if you look at it on a structural level, economic, political, the violent, men's violence against women, the level of objectification of women, the porn culture, which just enshrines a kind of aggressive masculinity and an anti-woman kind of sexual ideology, to, to say that we have equality, it's just it's not living in the same sort of universe that I live in. We don't have we're not we don't have gender equality. We have we have a long way to go. But people who say that, are, it's often because they haven't really thought it through. They have they're not particularly educated about these matters. They might think, well, yeah, we've had some successes, but it's it's. I would just urge you to think about that in terms of the, the racial analogy of saying we don't have racism or we don't have heterosexism because we have people like Robbie Rogers coming public about being gay. Okay, this is a great thing. There's a great leadership that's been happening by individual people, but we have deeply seated homophobia and heterosexism. In spite of the fact that we've had a lot of advancement, we still have a long, long way to go. And also, I would say in this room, we're we're in the United States. We're in you know the. LA, you know, I mean, I mean we're, in, we're in a very privileged circumstance. If you look around the world, there's like 700 million child brides in the world. 700 million women who are being basically sold to, 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 to men to buy, to, who are buying brides who are 11 years old, 12 years old. There's billions of women and children in the world who have absolutely no power whatsoever. So it's not just who we, who, those of us who are privileged, what kind of gender relations we have. We have to think about the whole globe, and the, on a global level, I swear to God, if I walked out of this room, if we were in certain parts of the world, I would be shot in the head for saying the things that I'm saying. Right. The women who are here wouldn't even be saying them because yeah. they couldn't even be in public. In, in, in other words, we have to always keep in mind that the world is a big place, it's a diverse place, and there's billions of people, and those of us who have power and privilege, especially some of us who are, you know, young, when you're young now, but you're gonna have increasingly opportunities to have influence in your, in your lives, Keep in mind that it's not just about your immediate circumstances, that there's a big world out there. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question. I, I would add to that, that, that you know, we mentioned in the global world, but there are people today in homes that can't speak honestly and upfront. There are women that are being oppressed today, that are being abused today. The sexual exploitation is increasing you know, all over this country. I mean, porn is increasing, and, and, and so it's not just globally. You go in communities, and there's women that are afraid to speak up. They, they, they feel in danger. They don't feel safe. And, and you know, and, and in working and me doing this work, you know, I, I end up working with a lot, of, um, a lot of men and women, but I work with a lot of women that, that have shared with me that early on in their own families, they felt unsafe. They walk in a room, and they feel, you know, the, the eyes of men are looking at them, and they just feel like they have to just, you know, close up. And when little girls, little four-year-old girls are feeling that, how can you say that we don't need to work on this issue? How can you say that, that, that when people that are, there's children that are feeling very unsafe and are feeling abused and are feeling, you know, basically uh, uh, you know, assaulted? I mean, this is an issue that, that really affects our relationships, affects our families, you know, affects our children. You know, and I think about, I have a granddaughter and you know, what, what kind of world do, do I want my granddaughters to grow up in? And, and, but, so, so I think you know, what you're saying, you know, the accident is, is really important because I think we have a long way to go. I mean, this conversation is very, very important, but the conversation has to take place at a lot of different levels, you know, from policy to practice to even how we do instruction. You know, and, and, and I think that what we're trying to do in a lot of schools is have this be an ongoing conversation, not just a special week, a special time, but let this be an ongoing, this should be part of a history class, part of all these classes that we're doing, that we should include these, these conversations, see how we can shift the paradigm that way. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. No more questions, all right. Uh, no more questions, but we're going to move on to the next segment very soon. <laughs>